you. We are thrilled to have you all here and our candidates. We are um, awaiting one more, but we're going to have to start without her. So I'm hoping she's on her way. Um, welcome. We are, um, as I said, thrilled to have you, thrilled to bring an event um, that's a little bit unconventional and hopefully enjoyable and also informative uh, for your election 2012 year. Um, my name is Margaret Rosas, and I am here representing the Santa Cruz Geeks, and I have up on stage Jeff Omerin, representing Santa Cruz Next, and Robert Middleton, Civonomics. And we, three organizations, came together along with Cruzeo um, to bring this event to you uh, this election year. So, without further ado, I'm going to have, um, each of us are going to say a little bit about our organizations, and I'm going to start with Jeff. Hey, Margaret, thank you so much. Thank you, all of you, for attending this evening. This is the most important, in my opinion, when it comes to politics. The impact of local politics is the most important. And for our future of the city and town and where we're going, being here tonight is just a great step in your commitment to Santa Cruz. So thank you again for being here. Uh, Santa Cruz next. We have a, a vision that is truly to inform the community, inspire our members, and really work for the good of, of the community and try to be a catalyst to connect our members with events like tonight, the Inside Scoop, and other really valuable events throughout Santa Cruz that we feel will be towards the betterment of our community. I would like to take a moment to have all of the next board members that are here just kind of be recognized, wave, or I'll point to you. And, and during the break, during the break tonight, please uh, come and, and visit with us to learn a little bit more about what Santa Cruz Next is, or maybe some of your visions for what you'd like to see in the community share with us. So without further ado, over to Robert. Hello, thank you. And thanks for coming out here again. Um, and thank you to our candidates for coming. Um, so a little bit about what Civonomics is, is that we are a local software company, um, actually incubated at UCSC. Um, and our mission is to improve the civic engagement process. So in the community so far, we've done around 2,500 interviews just in the city limits of Santa Cruz about local issues from water to climate action to soon to be homelessness or upcoming campaign. Um, and so we just want to, we really want to streamline the process by which people can get involved and have their voices heard. And so when we heard about this opportunity to get involved with these two wonderful organizations to really put a new spin on a kind of event like this where it's it's much more intimate in terms of being, you know, after the question and answer period to be able to have uh, a mixing um, and mingling period to actually go up and talk to candidates and ask them personal questions and things like that. So, really happy to be a part of this. Um, we're going to be launching a workshop that's going to follow up online at civonomics.com um, with the, the questions and the, and the candidates afterwards. So, please go ahead and check with that um, afterwards. So, the schedule for tonight's event is going to be uh, initially we're going to have a first question and answer session with our three moderators. Um, and then we're going to have a quick 30-minute mix and mingle session afterwards, which is kind of an intermission, and then finally a second uh, question and answer section for 45 minutes. And then a final mix and mingle session as we begin to close things out. Um, and I'll be doing timekeeping for the event, so make sure that all the candidates know. I'll have the iPad up and running. And yeah, will do. I'll definitely hold my hand up for you guys. And then you'd like to introduce the panelists? Yes. I would like to introduce the panelists. Um, we have on our panel, um, first we have on the far right, um, Cliff Hodge, Hodges, actually, sorry. Um, local, <laughs> local awesome dude who does uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurial activities and he's an environmental activist. He's the founder of Adventure Out and CrossFit West. Um, he's a Santa Cruz native and deeply interested in our community's future. In addition to his businesses, he also sits on several boards, including Santa Cruz Next and the Semper Vitans Club. Welcome. Yeah. And we have Peggy Dolgenos of Cruzeo. She's president and co-founder of Cruzeo Internet, which makes her literally the best connected person in town. <laughs> 10 gigabits in downtown Santa Cruz, which is pretty awesome. Um, she's an entrepreneur, programmer, and graphic designer with a goal of making technology work for every people of every stripe. And Chris Argenberg has worked in engineering for Adobe Systems and Western Digital. He's representing the Santa Cruz Geeks tonight. And he was a visiting researcher with the Institute for the Future. 
pretty cool stuff there. He's provided consulting for startups and enterprise clients, as well as the city of Santa Cruz and the U.S. government. <laughs> On the side, he produces music, surfs, and enjoys the mostly blissful returns of two decades in Santa Cruz. My, my job is to be able to pronounce all your names, so I apologize. We have Mike Posner, Rochelle Norian, Pamela Comstock, Cece Panero, Don Lane, Steve Pleitch, <coughs> Steve Pleitch, <laughs> Steve Pleitch, <laughs> Cynthia Matthews is missing, and I know Cynthia that she Matthews? is yeah. intending to be here, um, and Jake Fusari. Welcome, and I will let you guys get started. All right, so without further ado, we're going to get going here with the first question. Uh, and just so you guys know, Robert here is our timer. Standard questions will always be a one-minute response time unless we say otherwise. Um, and he will have a timer going. So I'm not going to waste any more time. The first question is for Cece. <laughs> first one on the hot seat. Here we go. All right, hey, Daniel. Cece. Yes. Do you have any specific ideas how to increase citizen participation in city government? Increase citizen participation. Bacon. <laughs> well, this could be the answer to many questions, but um, I believe, hang on now. I think that we need to leverage the things that we do well, and that we need to bring the unity back in the community. Um, what, what do we do well? Arts and tourism, education and nature, and now I'm sounding like a politician, like I'm not even answering your question. So, ask it again. Specific goals to increase participa participation in city government. Specific ideas as how to do that. Um, well, having a youth panel or a youth portion of the city council. When I was on the school board, we ha always had a youth and time. Thank you very much. representative. There you go. Very good. Bacon. <laughs> we'll all uh, get our footing here. Um, so this question was going to be for Cynthia, uh, but for now I'm going to improvise and give this to Pamela. Um, <clears throat> do you have any specific ideas on how to increase citizen participation in city government? <laughs> I've been focusing on uh, increasing community participation and one of the things I found is that when you give our community an opportunity to participate in the solution they show up and that's been evident in our drug den cleanups and our recent our cleanup of Evergreen Cemetery and the Shannon Collins Victims March and and every time we have one of these events people come out and they talk to us and they say we want to be heard we feel invisible we want somebody to reach out to us and we're being seen as a leader and so I will use that leadership on City Council to host town hall meetings so instead of having that two minutes when a topic comes up that you feel really strongly about you know you can maybe fit it into your schedule to rush down to City Council we can have these town hall meetings on a monthly basis when or whenever it's needed and we can come out and hopefully um, come up with solutions together thank you So, Don Lane, how would you attract more businesses to Santa Cruz? Um, there's so many different ways, but I'll, let me highlight one. Uh, uh, Peter Cope from our, our city economic development development department is here. And one of the things that I'm going to do is just keep him at work. <laughs> he is amazing at doing that. But one of the things that he's doing, in addition to kind of his hands-on work out, to the, out in the business community, is he's led a project called Op Open Counter, part of our grant from Code for America, that is going to make it so much easier for businesses, large and small, to get started, to simplify our permitting process at one, one stop on the internet, see everything that needs to be done, one point of contact. And this is often what we've heard is, is the biggest imp impediment to businesses getting started is it's complicated. So the city has heard that, we're about to roll this out, and it's really going to transform. All right. 
Excellent, okay, so I have a question for Jake, sorry. Jake, in your opinion, what are the major off-highway, as in city streets, traffic issues, and how would you address or solve them? So is the Highway 9, Highway 1 not one I can talk about? Yeah. Uh, Bay and Mission is really dangerous for bicyclists, as I've heard from a lot of people I know who bike, um, and I live right in that neighborhood. So that's a big concern to me, and, um, and it's tough to pinpoint one way that you could that you could address that problem and fix it, but I think that um, it needs to be monitored more by by uh, police officers, like it, it is sometimes at the start of the uh, of the of the term at UCSE. You can't come down Bay Street and speed because you'll get a ticket if anybody drives down there. You know where that one is, and you just don't speed. And there needs to be more of that. And um, that's pretty much the main one that I know of. Uh, I I don't really like the the roundabout either. Um, I think that it was uh, it wasn't very good before, but the roundabouts made it worse. So that's that's definitely of concern to me too. Thank you. Is this for Micah? Uh, so uh, knowing that conservation has been a key component of our water management plan, uh, how would you how would you balance uh, our water needs with the need for economic growth? Well, we've done some conservation, and to me, it's just shown that we can do more, that we can we can um, be better, both in a micro level. So, I just called George Wilson, and they're gonna next month install this thing under my sink that holds five gallons. And when I flush my toilet, the water will go into my toilet. According to Sloan Plumbing, which is not a low OEP company, you know that's gonna save like six percent of my residential water supply. So that's a micro level thing that we could do, and that the city could do. The city could take water neutral development money and pay people to go around like pg e does and install those things. At the macro level, we could do the similar issues with gray water. So our water treatment plant is right by the wharf, which the city owns. The city could run pipes under the wharf, which would be relatively easy, and put gray water in all the toilets of the wharf. And then we could offer the same thing to the boardwalk. And the boardwalk toilets flush in the summer. So if we gave them, so told the boardwalk, look, you can pay half the water rate to retrofit your toilets with gray water in the summer, that's the kind of thing we do, you know. It's there's no simple answer. When you want to live within boundaries as an environmentalist, you don't look for simple solutions. You look for two percent here, three percent here, four percent here, and you make it work while having a moderate amount of growth. Great, thank you. All right. Okay. So now we switched uh, places. So this one's for Cynthia, and um, how can we get? Oh, this is a good one for me. How can we get companies that started in Santa Cruz to stay in Santa Cruz? Thank you for staying. <laughs> there, you're, you're in a tech mind frame here, and that's probably what you're thinking, because we do think of the tech startups, and then they get to a certain size, and they want to migrate to Silicon Valley. Uh, there are a lot of different companies in Santa Cruz. So for each sector, I think the important thing is to uh, talk to the reach out and talk to the people in those sectors and find out what are their issues, what, what will keep them here, what are their obstacles to growth. We do have some great companies that have started here and stayed here. O'Neill, NHS, there are some fantastic ones. Um, many years ago when I was mayor, I did go out uh, with our economic development director and talk to um, company owners very small, from six employees to very large ones, and asked exactly these questions. And it was pretty revealing. They talked about the things that kept them here in Santa Cruz, the things that were obstacles, the things that were driving them to relocate. And uh, many of them were making conscious choices. Am I? Stop. Right time? Oh, OK. Sorry. I didn't know what the time limit was. Stop. What? Seriously. <laughs> <It's just> but, <laughs> OK. It's right well, I saw that, but I didn't know what OK. So. <laughs> Next question. This one is for Rochelle, and it is actually the exact same question. How can we get companies that started here in Santa Cruz to stay here? I think there's a variety of things we can do. There's no silver bullet involved in this. Uh, one thing that I noticed when I worked over the hill for an assembly member, the career technical education programs on that side of the hill uh, coordinate amazingly well together from the university level down to what the Workforce Investment Board does. 
and they look ahead to see what the county workforce needs are and then they adjust the classes offered at high schools community colleges and even the UCs to fit what the future needs of that community would be as well as the recent needs one of my favorite examples is they decided they needed solar installers so they started a solar installation program and there were a group of uh, young men who and I say men because it literally was that who oh, some of them ex-cons are going to step out with solar installer degrees and they'll be making forty thousand dollars a year installing installing panels so it's that type of uh, innovation that I think we could have here to keep businesses around. Excellent. This is for Steve. Uh, this is kind of building on or challenging uh, Jake's question. Um, what are some of the major off-highway challenges for uh, traffic issues in our town and how would you solve them? Well, uh, a couple years ago when I ran for city council, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was make this a better bicycle town, a better bike town. Uh, we don't spend nearly as much money, we don't strategize nearly as creatively, we don't really plan for the future as much as we should in terms of having people be able to bike around, to bike transit, to bike commute, to be able to be safely transported from one place to another simply on their own two wheels. We need to do much, much, much more of that. We simply don't do that. Uh, there are other things I think that we need to consider, and one of the ways that we can reduce our non-bike traffic, non-pedestrian traffic, is by having people be able to work and live in Santa Cruz, be able to be able to walk to where they to where they work, be able to walk to where they go to school. Uh, there are several programs that we have already about uh, greenways to school, things like that. Those are the kinds of things you want to encourage. And the more we do that, the more we make ourselves a better bike town, the more that we'll be able to solve the challenges of our off highway traffic. Okay, so the next question I have is for Pamela. And Pamela, what type of growth do you see as positive and sustainable for Santa Cruz? Uh, positive and sustainable? I think we need to bring in new businesses. I think we can take some of our existing buildings on Ocean Ave and upcycle them. I think there's plenty of opportunity for growth in our community. and. Um, based on the num figures from the recent Gibbs report, we're seeing that a lot of people in our community are shopping elsewhere. So if we can provide places for them to shop and spend their money, uh, if we can grow that way to start, uh, I think that that would be sustainable. Uh, but, but one of the keys to actually growing our economy is to work with our existing businesses and make sure that they're thriving and that'll be the best way to attract new businesses to our community. So we need to work with our current business owners and uh, come up with an action plan to increase business. Okay, thank you. This question's for Dawn. Uh, so uh, this is uh, sort of looking at our um, uh, food and farm community. We're having some really uh, exceptional uh, movement in this area for our community. Uh, and the question is, what type of growth do you see as possible? I'm sorry, <laughs> my fault. So many questions. Uh, how will you promote our emerging food and farm economy uh, and its culture in Santa Cruz? Uh, I think we, we, I think we're doing it. Um, and one of the, where, kind of what I would roll back to is not just zeroing in on that, but just how do we promote essentially our visitor economy because I think that's how it will really grow more, that part of our economy will grow is because we are known, become known as we are beginning to as a, a destination for, um, for organics and great food, locally grown food. Um, so I think that it's kind of, it's working with some of the entities that can, you know, like the Conference and Visitors Council to publicize this, working with some of the associations that are in that field, working with the Conference and Visitors Council to really highlight what already exists because it's so, it, there's so much out there for us. And I think um, one way, an example of something that could happen is creating something of a new festival that highlights that and then really publicizing that festival to bring people into the community. And thank you. Hi, my question's for Micah now. You're on the spot. So, um, what cities do you see as models for Santa Cruz's development in the future? 
Well, we are a great city in that we have a lot of interactions with people. And to me, the definition of a successful city is the most interactions with people as possible. If you don't want to interact with people, you should live out in the country. And that includes, of course, commercial interactions, which are really critical for the health of our city. So my model is San Francisco. Let's see if we can be, you know, San Francisco, like a small version of San Francisco where you can walk out of your house and up to the top of the mountains like my family did last summer. But you can also have that kind of intelligence and interaction and commercial activity and just sort of buzz happening and cheap burritos too, I would like to see. Um, all, you know, all in our urban environment. Portland's another example which is similar. Um, a little more spread out but served well by, you know, trains and public transportation. Um, Cairo, I love Cairo. Has anyone ever wandered around Cairo? It's like the amount of depth of culture and interactions that you get in Cairo. That's what I want to see. I'm not interested in, you know, being Orange County or San Diego County. Santa Cruz is a city, so let's build it up as a great city. Okay. And I would actually like to ask Jake that same question. Looking forward, what cities do you see as models for Santa Cruz development? Yeah, I'm glad I get to answer this question. Um, when I was trying to think of what I would say when you got it, uh, it's really hard to say what you would want Santa Cruz to look like in the future. And, and the first thing I was wondering is how far in the future are we looking? Um, I don't think that there's any, there's, there's nowhere in the world like Santa Cruz. Um, you mentioned Portland. That's a place that has a, a rich art, music, culture, like Santa Cruz does. Um, San Francisco is the same, but but I can't see San, Santa Cruz being like anywhere else because Santa Cruz is kind of a community of free thinkers, and we're not really like anyone else. So I don't I don't think I'll uh, I'm not going to pin one city. I, I don't want to be like any other city. I want to be like Santa Cruz, and I want to grow independently and and just be Santa Cruz in the future and be the best Santa Cruz that we can be. Uh, this is for Cece. Um, so, government moves slowly and can often be resistant to change. Um, what specific plans do you have to drive uh, the adoption of digital technologies within city government? Well, one of my first projects is this educational tourism project that I would like to implement and um, that directly is in regard to technology and also directly and indirectly. Um, the educational tourism project I came up with because I looked at who are the two largest employers in the city of Santa Cruz, the boardwalk and the university. So I thought let's put those two together and that what the university doesn't do is provide continued education units for professionals whether it's tradesmen or lawyers or doctors or nurses or anybody that needs to have continuing education units. So we can have those classes for continuing education units at the Tannery Arts Center, at the museum, at Cruz I.O., at Next Space, at the new Warriors Stadium, wherever it is that we have, we can hold these things. Um, we can do that from how to build an Apple iPad app, you know, to make it a new sound for the timer. Thank you. We'll hold those classes here. Okay, and now uh, this question is for Cynthia again. So uh, what type of growth do you see as positive and sustainable for Santa Cruz? Um, several ways of interpreting growth. Um, developments, people, uh, let's take those two. We're, we're a more or less built out city, so we're gonna operate within the city limits that we have. So um, communities change. And we have the opportunity to look at some uh, areas that uh, are maybe no longer thriving in the industry that they were, no longer existing, we can reuse those. Tannery Art Center is a great example. Once processed a whole lot of hides, dumped all the junk in the river, gone. So we've now re reconceived that with, with the partnership of a nonprofit and city and private money into the wonderful Tannery Art Center. Other examples as well. Let's talk about people. We recently adopted a general plan for the city of Santa Cruz, and it does accommodate a little growth. Um, let's just think of all these bright, brainy people graduating from, from the university who want to live here and make their careers here. We want to be able to absorb them and their great energy and ideas. Great. OK. Oh, OK. 
Okay, so I have a, another question for Rochelle. And it's a question you've already heard. What will you do to promote our emerging food and farm economy and culture? I have an answer for that. <laughs> well, we're already on our way. We have a magazine, um, and I cannot, I think it's called Monterey Bay Edibles. Oh, Edible Monterey Bay. So we're on our way. We're already starting to do things like that. Um, I know one of the writers for that magazine. And I don't know how wide the distribution for that is, but it is a wonderful magazine. Uh, I think we need to expand our brand as Santa Cruz. Obviously, the you know we have the boardwalk, we have the beach, and that's great. But we're a town where you can come here and spend more than just a day. We have this, um, I'm calling them sort of foodie pods that we have around Santa Cruz right now where you can go try wine out at the uh, Swift Street Courtyard. So there's a lot of potential in this area. Um, for instance, I was reading, I think, AAA Magazine, and Sonoma County has something called the Milk Highway, which along the Milk Highway are cheese uh, tasting places that you can go from, you can spend the day going and tasting cheese. So I think we can do similar things here. Thank you. It's for Steve. Yes. Uh, how would you approach building a better relationship with UCSC? Well, I'd approach that by starting to build a better relationship with UCSC. <laughs> I think everybody talks about the town gown dilemma, about what kind of separation there is, but people have to understand that we are only going to thrive in the future with a mutually reciprocal, mutually beneficial relationship between UCSC and the city of Santa Cruz. It's a great university on the hill, we are a great city here, but we have to forge true uh, economic uh, uh, partnerships, we have to forge true technology partnerships, we have to forge true environmental partnerships. Unless we can do that and work together on all of those issues, neither one of us are really going to thrive to the extent that we really can. Our combined energies is really where we're at. One of the things that I am concentrating on in my campaign is to do everything I can to put the city of Santa Cruz in a position where they are talking to UCSC and developing that kind of partnership day after day after day until town gown is something that we've completely forgotten and it's just one solid united front. Great, thank you. Okay, now it's time for the show of hands question. So if you thought those answers were short, it, yeah, exactly. No, you should know the question before you raise your hand. So <laughs> if you thought those questions were quick, then here's some even quicker. All right, here's one anyway. Um, now think carefully, <laughs> like you did before. Do, do you consider internet access a right, an option, or a luxury? Okay, so how many do we have for it's a right? How do we say an option? How do we say, how many say a luxury? All right. Okay, now we ask the audience. It's the audience challenge. So the question again is, do you consider internet access a right, an option, or a luxury? So who thinks it's a right? Okay, who thinks it's an option? There's still a lot. And who thinks it's a luxury? <laughs> All right, not so many. Interesting. Okay, and then the second part to this question, should the city pay for public access, public Wi-Fi? Okay, how many think yes, the city should? How many think no, the city should not? Is it yes or no? It's yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, like who, who didn't vote? You didn't vote? We kind of both did the. Oh, yeah? Did. Okay, you want to be seen as not voting? Oh, oh, yes. You're voting yes? Jay, last chance vote? That the city should pay for. Pay for public access. wise. Yeah. for everybody. Yeah. I've been to countries where, where internet is a luxury and it doesn't, it's, it's really tough. Well, I, we can't explain. This is not an explaining question. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so good. And now we're going on to the third question for each one. Typical politicians. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oops, sorry, we didn't ask that one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, I got less questions because it's it's, we have three and there are eight. So I get to do this whole part because I find this very thrilling. 
<laughs> so, audience, I, you've had time to think about this question, so I'm sure you're going to answer it carefully. Should the city pay for uh, internet, for public Wi-Fi? How many say yes? Ah. And then how many say no? Ah. All right. Yeah, they're pretty close. Okay, and on to more questions for the candidates with one minute answers. Yeah, that was 50-50, so you don't have to pander to anyone on that one. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure they all voted. It. I want to make sure. <laughs> okay, here we go. I have a question for Steve, and my question for Steve is, please describe in some detail your relationship to digital technologies. Wow, my relationship to digital technology. Uh, I don't really know how to explain that. I mean, I think I'm relatively tech smart. Uh, I think that I understand how to manipulate uh, digital technology to my own uses. I don't know that I could really explain how to use digital technology or what the benefits of it would be to someone else. So from that standpoint, uh, I can use it, I think, to enrich myself. I can use it uh, in ways that I think will benefit people that I can reach out to. But I don't know that I can really explain it well enough to anybody else to convince them one way or another that what they're doing has anything to do with digital technology. Okay. Uh, so this is to Rochelle. Uh, and a similar question that I asked before. Um, uh, what specific plans do you have to drive technology adoption within the city? Well, I'd like to see is coordination between the uh, different municipalities within town to have broadband in the whole county. I think it's necessary to attract businesses. Um, I look at Cruise.io as a really good example of what happens when you get that type of technology. And I don't know if I'm correct, but I believe your building is 95% filled, if not 100% now. And so I think that would be my biggest priority in terms of improving technology in Santa Cruz. I would like to see free Wi-Fi spots, especially in downtown Santa Cruz, and possibly um, in other areas as well. A quick follow-up. Do you think uh, city government has a substantial enough understanding of these technologies to really get behind these initiatives? Well, I don't know all of the staff people who work for, this, for the city, but they do uh, hire technical people. In fact, my husband works for the county, so I know that at that level they have people who are pretty savvy about what technology is available. So I think the city should look within their own staff and they might find they already have the expertise. Great, thank you. Okay, and uh, this one's for Jake. So, um, and it's one that we already asked, so hopefully you've thought about it a little. Please describe in some detail your relationship to digital technologies. <clears throat> um, well, my relationship with digital technology is that um, I was a marketing and advertising major at San Jose State, where I learned a lot about uh, Illustrator, how to use a digital camera, how to edit video, um, how to make websites, and I am working on my own website, so don't there's a lot of things I have to do before that. But um, so I, I'm really familiar with with technology, and and I use it, and I'm and um, I don't know how better to answer it. <laughs> I want to use more of my time, but do you think the city that people who are on city council should use digital technology more to reach out to their constituents? I think as soon as I'm voted into city council, we will be able to. <laughs> I have a question for Cece, and it is actually the same question. I'm going to make it sound a little different. In detail, I would like you to describe how you have a relationship with digital technology. Oh, I have a relationship with digital technology. That was poorly worded. <laughs> I, uh, well, I update my own website. Um, and you guys can go there, cc with the number four, sccc.org. Um, and uh, I, I've learned a lot. I've been to tech raising. I've learned a lot from my friends who actually uh, have spaces in Next Space, which is uh, All Together Now, and also um, Joanne Birch's organization that has a, has, has a space up in Next Space. Um, and 
I run a nonprofit and we use TechSoup, and TechSoup is a, an amazing uh, organization that helps nonprofits become tech savvy and be able to buy the latest technology at a discounted rate. And I also want to want to give a shout out to Bootstrap. Who knows what Bootstrap is? Okay. Okay, so I'll give it. I'll give a little shout out for Bootstrap. And Bootstrap Time. is the Twitter open open source project that makes uh, great looking websites easy. And that guy's coming to cruise island. Thank you, <laughs> Cynthia. Um, so, uh, building on some of the things we've talked about, uh, what can be done to expand broadband access in Santa Cruz? It could be to the home, it could be to businesses, or open Wi-Fi hotspots. This is not a strong area for me, so I'm going to put it back on those who operate in this field. You tell us what you need. Um, and the city definitely wants to be a partner. This is an area where we, where we can work with UCSC. There has been a partnership working with UCSC to bring, um, I think it's fiber over the hill to us. Um, but uh, this is certainly the foundation of a lot of our tech-dependent businesses. And we know that having good internet access is critical. You asked about what keeps people here, what drives them away. I know that that's one of the things that people say, I've got to have more more access. So um, in the role of city council, I think it's, it's talking to the industry, to the interest that needs to be served and finding out what are the key issues, what can the city do as a partner. None of these things can be done by the city alone, but we can be a great partner and we have been in the past. Thank you. Okay, and this question is for uh, Mr. Don Lane. Uh, and you've heard it a bit, so uh, what specific plans do you have to drive technology adoption within city government? A, a lot. Um, we, you know, we have a relatively new chief technology officer who's just outstanding. Um, we have, um, <coughs> I think we're just consistently upgrading. I mentioned our open counter effort, which is is not just, you know, one thing that's really important about that to, to realize it's, it's going to serve the community and new businesses really well, but it's also going to make internally in the city, we're going to be much more efficient in how we process applications for permits. Um, I think we're going to continue. We've um, had, had some work with Civonomics to use that kind of technology to get to work on getting greater public input. We used to do our city newsletter on paper, now it's all done digitally so I think we're clicking really well on on that in that area at this point and we'll just keep going okay I have a question for Micah Micah my question for you which is parts have been asked is what can be done to expand broadband access in Santa Cruz and do you believe city government should play a role in that yeah, we should bury a cable under the rail trail that we're going to build throughout the city. Um, we should run cables along our new gray water system that's going to <laughs> supply all the toilets in town. Um, and we can, I think we can, in a, in a long term, partially, incrementally, um, get those costs back. I know I have velocity at my, at my business and at my home, and I'm paying less money. So it could be, Peggy might not like it, but it could be that the city charges five bucks a month a person to recoup the cost of or barrowing the broadband and opening up those streets to do it and we can still have a lot of customers because I'm saving like 10 bucks a month you know by my combined phone bill and um, internet usage um, it also goes in along with this question about providing free wireless access at certain points in the city so a combination of increased broadband access and then also wireless points for you know users that aren't working out of their house all the time you know we could be really like a city that's super connected, and I was saying before, a successful city is about interactions. That includes internet actions over the, that includes connections over the internet. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cruz, I doesn't mind sharing with the city. Right. Pamela, uh, so I believe in our uh, show of hands, uh, you raised your hand for luxury, that, that internet access is a luxury. Um, and yet, for education, for business, for scientific pursuits, uh, internet access is increasingly very necessary right. uh, and very helpful. Uh, so, uh, given that, what uh, do you think we can do to expand the access well, to Well, I think broadband? I misunderstood your angle of the question initially, because when you said luxury or it's a right, I think it's something you should pay for. So I think you should have access to it, but it's not something, it shouldn't be a city expense. So assuming it's paid for, yes. um, 
how can we uh, bring more bandwidth to our city and to our stakeholders? So, uh, I work for a software company and our bandwidth and how quickly we get work done directly affects our productivity. It's a constant, constant conversation we have. So, um, for the city to get better broadband and faster internet access, we have to build a public, it's, it's super expensive, public-private uh, partnership, work with UCSE. We have some great partners here in our community. Um, so I think we need a small think tank to make sure this happens because it could really play a part in, in what types of businesses we can attract to Santa Cruz and what businesses will stay. Great, thank you. Okay, that's, we asked all the questions, right? We did it? Okay, so that was, uh, that was our first round. And now, I believe the schedule says that it's time to break and mingle. And what that means is everybody in the audience, I know you are all very curious now that you've heard some of the opinions. You all get a chance to meet each other and talk about things. And then on our side, uh, as moderators, we're going to think about follow-up questions to ask. And we're going to look at the Twitter feed and see if people have been um, asking things. And we'll also ask the candidates if there's something that they wanted to answer, uh, especially if it was a question we already asked. But you want to come back to it, or we asked somebody else we didn't ask you. So just talk to us during the break. <laughs> Just want to recap on things really quick. If you would like a question that you, or if you would like to submit a question to be asked up here, um, you can tweet a question to the hashtag CruiseVotes. Um, it will be displayed up here as well. Um, so if you're just interested in that, may or may, may or may not. But the candidates will see them, and that's what's important. Okay. I would just like to make a quick comment um, in terms of the the minute. The quick pace of the questions, I gotta say, it's a, it's a great to watch the candidates have to answer under this kind of pace. Um, because if you're at a city council meeting and you're actually at public comment, that's exactly what it's like to be up there, not have enough time and want to talk about a lot of the things. So, just putting that out there, it's great to watch. And without further ado. Primarily as an economic issue or as a moral issue. And we're saying how should we handle it? We know that you can see it both ways. But how should it be handled? As an economic issue or a moral issue? Okay, give a second. <laughs> no, we don't question the questions. <laughs> They're supposed to be challenging. So, okay, so economic or moral? Okay, hand, show of hands. How many think it should be treated as an economic issue? It's hard. These are hard questions. Okay, and how many is a moral issue? Ooh, I see people who've raised their hands twice. And that's no fair. Okay, okay we're gonna we're gonna go with that? You know, you don't get to do that. Okay. And now we're taking a comment, okay? Oh yeah. No, we all are, but sometimes we have to vote yes and no, don't yes or no, don't we? So, uh, anyway, uh, now, audience, this was a such a challenging question that, s that some people, frankly, on the city, on the uh, candidates forum, weren't really able to do a yes or no. Let's see how the audience does. Um, should homelessness be handled as an economic issue or as a moral issue? How many say economic issue? Okay. And how many is a moral issue? Okay. So we had a good number for economic, but moral had more, I would say. All right, good. Thanks very much. Okay, we're going to kick off our second round of questions here. And we were just joking, or not really joking, but um, talking amongst ourselves to say that round one is really about having a good time, and round two is really about just crushing everyone's dreams. So. <laughs> as long as you're crushing them equally, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And crush the egos, please. Okay, so here we go. Um, my first question is for Don Lane. 
And my question for you, Don, is that we have a very beautiful city and also what could be a very beautiful river. And I think most or many people in this town would agree that it's being underutilized in many ways. And what would you do to turn that river from a liability into an asset, both economically and environmentally? Um, I think we're really right in the middle of doing that. I think, uh, I want to just say that a, about a year ago, some really active people in the community approached the city council and said, come on, let's really make a change there. And the city council public safety committee, which I'm a member of, met with those neighbors and really started brainstorming what are some of the things we can do. And I think we've seen some real change this year. Um, some of the things that have happened are, you know, there's been a lot of cleaning up and mowing and managing the landscape better. It's been activating San Lorenzo Park. You know, we just introduced the Frisbee golf thing there. There's been some new um, stuff painted on the levee path that makes it kind of more of a run, a, a, a race course, a running course for people. I think those are the, we, we've act, increased um, the patrols of the first alarm security just to kind of keep an eye on things. And I think all of that is what it's going to take, plus demonstrating this to the community that we've built confidence that more people are welcome there, and they will be. Thank you. Uh, so this is for Cece. Um, and this is our hand-raising question, but I'm going to do you the benefit of rephrasing it slightly. Um, how can we balance uh, the sort of fine line between looking at homelessness from both a uh, economic and a moral perspective? Well, you know, like I said earlier, you know, put the unity back in community. Um, so how do we balance it? I'm, I'm a big, big advocate of the 180, 180 project, and I'm an advocate of mental health case workers downtown doing assessments and finding out what the needs of the people are. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to do exactly. Like, I, I don't have all the answers to homelessness. I, I believe that homelessness is, is not an issue. It's not a problem. What the problem is is people with behavioral problems. Whether you have a house or don't have a house, if you have a behavioral problem downtown, then that's the problem. And that we need to address that. That's what the 180, 180 project addresses is behavioral problems. And um, so there we go. We've got the hand raised, and I'm going to stop before the elephant makes its noise. All right, thank you. <laughs> OK, um, this is a question for Jake. Um, a lot of times we talk about all uh, the Santa Cruz brand, and people mention all the great things about it, the surfing, the outdoorsmanship, you know, beautiful uh, climate and uh, ge uh, geography. Uh, what does our brand lack, and why? <clears throat> That's a tough question. Um, we don't lack, I wouldn't say we lack anything. What we lack is kind of a structure of how we can take all of our attributes and put them into one brand. We, we had a question last week is, is what is Santa Cruz brand? And um, Steve and I said Surf City, but everybody had their other um, ideas of what Santa Cruz is. But I don't think that we lack anything other than we need to do a better job of kind of bringing them all in and, and kind of, no, we, we don't actually need to bring them all in. We need to, uh, I don't want to put one brand on Santa Cruz. I want Santa Cruz to be kind of a, a community or a union of free thinkers and, and people who kind of come together and celebrate their diversity and, and celebrate the fact that we all live in this beautiful place and to just brand it um, with eight seconds left would be kind of tough and I think that the brand of Santa Cruz is just a community of free thinkers. Answer, Cindy. Okay, so I have a question for Steve, and it is in a, along the lines of our hand-raising question, um, whether you want to consider homelessness an economic or moral issue or both, what are new strategies and tactics that the city can adopt to handle uh, both homeless issues and safety issues in our community? Well, I've been fortunate enough to be involved with a couple of different uh, organizations that are looking for transitional opportunities for the homeless folks. Uh, 
the Association of Faith Communities, uh, we are looking to establish satellite shelter programs to get people off the streets to give them an opportunity to be able to kind of get themselves together so they can really go to that employment you know, application or they can get the driver's license back. They do the kinds of things they need to do to get back toward, you know, being able to enjoy their lives and retain their integrity. I've also, uh, I'm the director of the Homeless Persons Legal Assistance Project, and so I provide pro bono legal assistance to the entire homeless community and because there are so many obstacles to their being able to get back into the mainstream, to be able to transition from reduced circumstances, oftentimes not even of their own making, into kind of a better place for them. I think the one thing we don't understand about the homeless community is that two-thirds of the people who are homeless tonight in Santa Cruz were Santa Cruz residents before they became homeless. These are our friends and neighbors. That's what makes it a moral question just as importantly as an economic question. Thank you. So uh, this is for Cynthia, and uh, this is kind of, uh, we have a, another question about brand, but I'm going to frame it just a little bit differently. Um, how do we balance our local needs with the requirements of our tourist economy? Well, tourism is our largest single tax generator, um, not necessarily the largest job creator, but it is the basis of our uh, the taxes when you take all of them together that uh, support our city services. So let's just put it on the table. Tourism is really important to us and our visitor industry supports a great deal of the uh, subsidiary, uh, the food and beverage and the retail shops and so forth that we depend on. The other thing I think that's very important to realize, people brought up about the emerging specialty food area of the arts. I think um, we're seeing that there are many more opportunities in terms of tourism visitor services with other sectors, whether it's active sports or birding in Watsonville or food festivals, whatever. There's a great richness here, wine tasting, whatever, uh, all of which supports this kind of diverse economic base that uh, we really enjoy here in Santa Cruz. So um, I don't really see necessarily uh, a diversion except when it comes to maybe just the impact in high season Thank crowds, you. and I don't have time. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a question now for um, Micah. So, um, Micah, uh, currently over 30,000 people commute over the hill, and um, many of them are going to high-paying tech, pay, high tech jobs, and we call this the brain drain. What would you do to improve the quality and quantity of high-tech jobs in Santa Cruz? Well, we talked about burying those cables under the rail trail. Um, I'm hoping to help shovel out that rail trail so I can get an extra shovel for another little ditch there. So I think, you know, that broadband question is totally pertinent. Um, to that, I also think some other questions about, like, keeping employers here. You know, when we have a successful high-tech company, how do we have them not migrate? And I think some of that solution is about the cost of housing. You know, I mean, all these things, it's a good question because it's wrapped up with so many other things. So. You know, um, the way I think we reduce the cost of housing, which also would help spur the economy, is to loosen up some of the ordinance and restrictions about both housing and commercial activities. For example, right now, um, if you want to um, run a little home business, depending on what it is, you have to provide parking, $40,000 for a garage. Who parks in their garage? You know, like, you know, does anyone in this room park in their garage? I mean, so, you know, we have these kind of ordinances that are designed to sort of protect a suburban lifestyle, which make it, which inhibit our economy. And, you know, I know that's, that's not directly related to your question, but all those kind of things are related. We have to make it affordable to live here and work here. Great. Okay, so I actually have the same question for Pamela, which is currently over 30,000 people commute each day over the hill, especially to high paying tech jobs, which we call brain drain. And what would you do to improve the quality and quantity of tech jobs in Santa Cruz? So I was one of those people for many years. I drove over the hill for six years to work at a, a software company called Veritas. And I'm delighted to be back on this side of the hill. But one of the things I think we could do is work with um, people at Next Space, people at Cruise.io, and, and UCSE, and find out what some of the emerging markets are and partner with them, because, especially UCSE, because they can best tell us what's on the horizon, what's new, where is their emerging market, what could Santa Cruz be known for. We could create business enterprise zones, we could maybe get some incentives for UCSE students, we could keep talent local, and uh, we could be a hub for something new, new technology. Great. 
This is for Rochelle. Um, so we have some uh, baked in assumptions about what our brand is, the things that come to people's minds immediately. Uh, and yet we have this sort of growing community of people um, working in technology, working in the robotics program up at UCSC, the gaming program. Uh, how can we leverage those, uh, those programs and those trends to sort of evolve the brand of Santa Cruz? So let me understand your question correctly. You're looking at the people graduating from UC Santa Cruz and figuring out how that can be our brand as opposed to being a tourist How can town? we augment our brand? How can we evolve our brand to be more inclusive of these technologies? That, and, and really the deep uh, sciences that are coming out of the university and its affiliates. Well, I think one of the ways to do that and to make sure, and this is something I'm very interested in, is figuring out how we keep some of those video gamers here in town to hopefully create businesses here instead of going over the hill. We have one quarter of the cost for renting uh, office space right now in Santa Cruz compared to Silicon Valley. So I think it's really important that as a city we make those folks aware that there's an opportunity to start a business here and it, it probably will be much cheaper. Once again, that goes back to broadband. I think in order for them to feel like they're part of the culture here in Santa Cruz, we've got to have that or we have to have buildings like Cruz I.O. with uh, that type of access to it. That's one way to do it. Um, in terms of wrapping it into our tourist brand, I'm not sure how that would help us as a town in terms of attracting more people to come and play here. Thank you. Okay, so we finished that, uh, that bunch of questions and now we're gonna have another yes or no question. Okay, so. Um, UCSC has long planned to expand into the virtually untouched uh, North Campus area, including the diverse and endangered sec second growth forest, Chaparral and Meadows. But we're also talking about how important UCSC is to us and our, and our uh, economic success, and we'd like to, to work with them more. Are you in favor of restricting the UCSC upper campus ecosystem from campus expansion? Are you in favor of restricting it? Some restriction or complete restriction? Yeah, that's a good question. And Santa Cruz has absolutely no authority, legal authority, yeah. over UC. Yeah. Anyways. I, we, 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 we I know that. State. It was very popular. We could have yeah. state, state land. Right, right. state land. Yeah. It can still be good to know you your vision. Be you can still be in favor of restricting it even if you can't do anything about it. Absolutely. Right. Right. So, 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 so are we saying question. some restriction or a lot? Any, some restriction. Okay, so we, uh, yeah, I guess are we in favor of uh, putting pressure on them and, or trying to restrict it in some way? Okay, who wants to uh, to uh, restrict voting? Yes, we should be restricting UCSC on their uh, the, their upper campus development. Okay, and who's uh, saying the other way? And let's not restrict. I know it's terrible, and frustrating, isn't it? It's a gray area. But I would just say, comprehensive settlement agreement. Bacon. <laughs> okay. We will recycle. We will, we will. I support, okay. I support some restriction that would help make it happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Right. No, I know everybody, but that's what we uh, were thinking. This one was a popular question that we were uh, asked to ask. So, okay, audience, who's in favor of restricting the growth in the uh, UCSC North campus? Okay. And who's in favor of not restricting it, letting the university grow? Okay. Yeah, every time you ask it's a little different, I know. But, uh, but you know, uh, that's, it's a complex question, it's true. Okay, and that time I thought we had more people who were in favor of restricting, but we still had a good number who were in favor of, uh, of less restriction or no restriction. Okay. Okay, so yeah, before we move on, I know a lot of these questions are confusing to people and a lot of the times you feel like there's nothing you can do about it anyways, but these are the questions that voters wanted to hear answers to. So whether you can do anything about it or not, they still want to know what you think. So, okay, so my next question is for Rochelle. And that question is, what can we do on a local level to bring energy independence directly to Santa Cruz citizens? Cite a specific example of how we might build a better local energy infrastructure. So we're talking about creating, let's say, our own uh, 
energy source are, internally? Is that what the, do you think the question's getting at? No, but how can we bring new forms and energy independence directly to Santa Cruz? So whether that's our own, it could be our own, or it could be from elsewhere, that's not. Well, in town we already have several solar companies that have great financing programs um, where you don't even need to put money down and it ends up getting wrapped into your energy bill. So I think those are great opportunities. Um, in terms of the city, there are incentives that the city has for you know, doing everything from buying, uh, you know, low, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm getting my words mixed up. Um, everything from like low flow water type devices, low flow or low use energy devices. Um, they're, they're just, you know, you can look, there's so many models around the country for, that we could look at to see if where you could do better than what we're doing now to encourage people to use less energy. Thank you. This is for Pamela. Um, and it's actually the same question, but I'll try and slightly rephrase it. Um, uh, how can we encourage uh, our citizens, both uh, sort of financially uh, and through education, to adopt uh, very direct measures to conserve energy on their own and perhaps to generate energy on their own? Well, I think anytime you're trying to encourage citizens, there needs to be a financial incentive, typically. So I've seen that with PG&E. When you buy a low, uh, you know, a low-use refrigerator, you get a kickback. Same with toilets and water, you get a kickback. Um, so I think that we would have to put out some citywide information about how we could partner together to reduce energy use. Thank you. Okay, and this one is for Steve. Yeah. Um, can you think of a development project that either uh, did or did happen that shouldn't have happened, or didn't happen, but it should have happened? <laughs> and can you discuss that? The, it, just a decision that went poorly. Well, um, I've always thought that uh, the way that we handle La Bahia project was just simply a mismanagement of the beginning. Uh, I think the conversation has to start on that again. I think we have to reapproach the Coastal Commission. I have to think we have to look at new developers. That's a project that's just a blight on the beachfront. And it's $700,000 of revenue in our tax base that we don't get every year. Now, why that's happening, uh, I don't know. But what I would do on City Council, what I intend to do on City Council, is to start that conversation anew and start it immediately because the La Bahia cannot exist as it is, and we can't have that kind of a hole in a revenue stream. Okay, I have a question for Jake. This one's pretty wide open, my man. What is the number one issue that keeps you up at night that needs to change in Santa Cruz? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because <laughs> the number one issue to me is that when you walk out of your front door, there's uh, a chance that someone's going to be in your front yard. And uh, my car was broken into two weeks ago and they stole my tools that I used to, to provide for my family. I'm a carpenter and they stole tools out of my toolbox. Uh, and then the very next night, I went out to go get some frozen yogurt for my wife, and um, I found somebody trying to get into my truck. And um, I didn't want to confront them, obviously, because um, I'm just not confrontational. But I called the police, and, and unfortunately enough, I never saw a car come by at all. And the guy wound up leaving when he knew that I put a new lock on my toolbox. But that's definitely what keeps me up at night when I fear for my family's safety. Another thing that keeps me up at night is that... So let me actually delve into that question a little more. So public, public safety is an issue for you. What are, what's a new way, what's a new approach that we can handle public safety as a city? Well, last night we were at the Santa Cruz Neighbors Forum, and I think more organizations like that that could be put together and getting more people involved and starting their own neighborhoods and neighborhood watch programs, and that's something that you can do on your own. But, I mean, the big thing is is that the city needs more revenue through, you know, responsible growth and development to provide the police department with the funds that it needs to get the job done and to really clean Santa Cruz of its crime problem. Okay. This is for Micah. <clears throat> so, uh, how can digital technologies enhance public safety 
And what are some of the risks of relying on machines and algorithms to uh, manage our security on our behalf? Well, my dad just got his bike stolen at the Metro, so this one's for you, Dad. And uh, his suggestion is to make a little cage, you know, around the bikes and put a camera up. Um, not to try to lock the cage in some way, but just so that people walking in and out of the cage, you know, were seen by the camera. Um, and the risk of that, of course, is that um, that information we misuse to put people in little boxes to guess, you know, who's doing what or to sort of, um, you know, have class bias affect people. So the, the Santa Cruz Police Department is uh, getting some international recognition for what is sort of being billed as a pre-crime program, where they're using uh, analytics data that they collect off of our activities through these devices to model who and where uh, crimes are most likely to occur. Uh, and this obviously has some very interesting and nuanced uh, ethical considerations. So this is much, much beyond the camera. When the camera can recognize your face, it's sort of a different situation, potentially. Well, I'm familiar about that program, and I'm hopeful about it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's kind of a be-all, end-all. I know we're talking to the technological crowd, but you know, the cops know that in my neighborhood there's a lot of crime already. I mean, I live in the Lower Ocean neighborhood. You know, and if they had sufficient resources or sufficient tools, or we were organized enough as a community, we would be stopping crime in my neighborhood. So I think it's it's hopeful. Hopefully, we make their work more efficient, and I support it. Uh, but we also need to look at, you know, societal solutions. Great, thank you. Okay, and uh, this one is a question for Cece. And uh, same question um, that I was asking Jake before. Uh, can you think of a development project that either should have happened and didn't, or did happen but shouldn't have? And can you talk about that, describe, you know, what you think should have happened? Oh man, I want to answer a different question. <laughs> I get to use my minutes any way I want, right? Well, there was this project that probably nobody remembers, and it's uh, there's a bunch of houses that was that were built um, right off a of lighthouse in this small little cul-de-sac by the old Morello High School, and um, there was no low-income housing, no Measure J, no Measure O houses provided there, and I was really upset. That was something that happened, I don't know how many years ago, some of these guys might remember, but um, once you let a developer build a housing project with 10 or more houses and not allow a Measure O housing, which is the moderate low income housing in there, and you cut some other deal for some other housing somewhere else because you want to put the low income people in the ghetto instead of in the nice neighborhood by the Westcliff, that, that to me was you know, unconscionable and that whatever city council was there, they'd cut that deal. And I'm still a little bummed out because there should have been a Measure O house near Westcliff. Okay, so I have a question for Don Lane, and that is regarding public safety. Uh, this question is, are you in favor of using digital technology and, and specifically our new predictive policing system uh, here in the city? And uh, whether it be that or something else, we would like to hear one concrete example that has not yet been done of how we can improve public safety. Okay. Wow, I have to do both those in one minute. Okay, on the predictive policing, I, I actually think that's really a, a useful tool for the city. I think it's, you know, some of the implication there is that there's, there's some, uh, that this is person-based, and if it was, I would have a problem with it. But the reality is, all it does is say, here's where we want patrol cars to go and check. We have a reason to believe that that street or that neighborhood is more likely to have a crime occur um, than anywhere else in town, and we should make sure we spend a little more time being with our patrol cars being there. So I, I do support that notion. Um, in terms of an, an additional public safety thing, for me, one of the things, even though often it's not thought about as public safety, I do think it really is, um, is addressing homelessness in a more comprehensive way. We all talk about the issues of homelessness and crime in the same breath, so many different ways we do that. And so it's going to take a comprehensive approach to homelessness that will end up addressing some of the public safety issues that we face.
Uh, this is for Cynthia. So this is kind of similar to the previous question about technologies. Um, should we allow software to watch our behaviors and make decisions about those behaviors? That's already happening, and you all know that. <laughs> and I think the vast majority of what's happening is way out of the hands of the Santa Cruz City Council. Um, that's a national debate, and we don't have any clue how much is being gathered about what we do, buy, think, click onto, et cetera. So would you say that you are generally opposed to that trend, or fearful of it, or is it something that you uh, anticipate and feel that we will have to address as a community in some form? We have to address it as way more than a community, I think, yes. Well, and yet we're bounded by our region and our access. The, the issues of personal privacy and what's co connected in terms of all our internet activities um, is something I personally have concern about. I don't think the platform for dealing that with that is the Santa Cruz City Council. In terms of other information, it was mentioned um, uh, surveillance cameras and so forth. Actually, I have supported those in public places, and those have been proven to be very useful in um, capturing images of crime in process, identifying perpetrators, and leading to conviction. So there are two different issues they do have to do with uh, recording personal activity. The other's in a public space. Thank you. And, and some of these questions are not specific to the council. Good response. OK. Now. I know you guys didn't like the previous yes or no questions. I like them. <laughs> some of them are good. I know some of them are not perfect, right? But this one is really good, and I, I promise you'll all like this one. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be a good one. Right. Do you like ice cream? I like that one. But is that controversial? No, not really. OK. So. Uh, as we explored, now we've been talking about how important it is to encourage the tech, tech industry in Santa Cruz. That's something near and dear to our hearts, who are the moderators and the, the people who set this up. Um, and we talked about how important it is. Uh, as we explore the development of the tech industry, and we look at the success of the tannery, which provides housing to local artists, and that's working out really well to have that kind of a center and affordable housing for uh, artists. Uh, would you be in favor of having a tannery for tech? Think about it a second. Okay, yes. who says yes? yes. And who says no? Any more? <laughs> it would be like the housing for like the tannery, only for tech. Work live. No one would be able to sleep, right? No sleeping. <laughs> well, we don't sleep. No, that's what I thought. I was just checking. In fact, we cannot sleep because people call us and say that their computer doesn't work. Okay. So, now the audience. What do you guys think? Would you be, how many are in favor of having a tannery center for tech? A lot of people. And how many are not in favor? There are a few. Okay, that's great. All right, and now on to the last bunch of questions. Okay, so I have a question for Cynthia. And we've already discussed our term called brain drain, which is 30,000 people commuting over the hill, especially in high tech every day. What, in your opinion, is the most important piece of legislation that could either be passed or struck down to help combat this? Legislation. Whoa. <laughs> I'm just going to shift gears uh, entirely um, because I want to talk about something that I think has been productive in keeping intellectual talent here in Santa Cruz, and it's one of the side benefits of the comprehensive um, settlement agreement with UCSC, and that is a much higher uh, level of communication and cooperation between the engineering and tech uh, and business departments at UCSC and connecting um, the graduates, while they are still graduates, with the business community here in Santa Cruz, giving them business opportunities, and also working with tech transfer uh, cooperation and cultivating that, and it's neither the city's responsibility nor the university's, but when they work together, they can do a great job on that. 
Very good. I'm surprised we haven't seen that move sooner. We should just change the question. Don't encourage us. Risky. 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 Jake. So uh, the question is, uh, how can the how can the city better use social media to both engage the citizenry and to have more effective governance? Well, I think the city's website could use a little tune-up. I think it could um, use have be more accessible to social media where you kind of log into your um, iPhone or Android or your computer and, and see what's happening right now, like things streaming live in the city, what, what somebody's kind of a, a, um, applying to do, what the, what the new freshest ideas are that you don't have to um, wait for the next day to, for the paper, but wait, sorry, I don't even answer, uh, understand the question. Really. <laughs> social media. Everybody's I'm starting that. to kind of try to change it. The Twitters, the Facebooks, yeah. YouTube. Um, this is how we'll change it. If I'm a city council member, one thing I've already planned is I want to um, use Instagram and Twitter to keep the community up to date with things that I'm doing in the community that's going to directly reflect their lives and their families' lives and our whole community. So yeah, if I'm on city council, you're going to be seeing what I'm doing. I'm going to be using social media. I'm going to be doing a lot. Thank you. Okay, and uh, this one's for Rochelle. So Rochelle, uh, this is a question that's been around before. Uh, looking at um, developments that have happened or not happened in recent years, uh, what's one that you think either should have happened but, they, but it didn't, or it happened and it was a boondoggle or just shouldn't have, have happened? I absolutely believe the La Bahia project should have happened. I think that would have um, enhanced our Beach Street area greatly. When you look at the businesses around the La Bahia, they've all upgraded. They look beautiful. Uh, it's becoming a really nice street and a place that I'd want to go if I were a tourist. But then you have this, you know, blight sitting there. It's ugly. It's run down. And we can argue about why it is that way. But the fact is that would have been a very appropriate place for a high-end hotel. It would have been beautiful and it would have employed people who live in the nearby Beach Flats community. There was a specific program offered to those folks for training to come in and work. And when you look at the jobs that have gone because of Wrigley's and Lipton's, I know that we can't bring those back, but at least we could have maybe put a dent in what left with those industries uh, by having the La Bahia down on, on Beach Street. All right, just a few more questions here. We're getting near the end. Just rem remind you all, we did say this round was much more about crushing dreams than the first one, so. All right, so I've got a question for, for Don Lane. Don't worry, not crushing any dreams. Don, what would you do to make Santa Cruz more attractive to new tech companies? To new tech So no, just to tech companies, new world. Um, well, I feel like people have said some really good things about this. I think getting greater um, broadband access around the community is really critical to that. Another is, um, and some of this is happening, that like the Delaware edition, creating new um, physical spaces that are up to date, you know, and, and uh, really ready to receive uh, tech um, businesses in them. A third, which Peggy knows more about than anyone, is making sure that our, because we're not going to have a lot of new growth and a lot of new big buildings, if we really make this, and the city is really making progress here, make it easier for to repurpose buildings. When a building has been, was in an old industry and, has, and that industry is fading, let's be able to transform that building into something new um, that would be, you know, and really be upgraded and then be suitable for tech. Great. This is for uh, CC. Uh, so I lived in Santa Cruz for 20 years. My commute is 75 minutes each way. Uh, my wife to be drives to Santa Cruz twice a week and is able to somewhat work remotely otherwise. For the first time in our lives and our tenure in Santa Cruz, we're thinking of moving. Basically to spare our backs, our cars, our fuel expenses, and to try and be a little bit more sustainable. Can you tell me, preferably with some uh, rational and actionable message, why I should not move away from Santa Cruz? Well, <clears throat> there's certainly more to life than money. 
you, we live in the most Can you tell that place. to my, uh, my mortgage lender? <laughs> yes, I will tell that to your mortgage lender, absolutely. I'm happy to meet with anybody, anytime, on any, any topic. And, you know, we're going to rebrand Santa Cruz as Santa Cruz I.O., first of all, if that's yeah. the rebranding. We are going to um, have a marketing strategy called Santa Cruz the Game. So gamers will want to stay here, and you guys will want to stay here. And um, that would be similar to like geocaching, right? That's a game, we could, we could do that in Santa Cruz. And so I am trying to answer your question. But basically, you know, my grandson is here in the audience. And that's what's important to, fam to Santa Cruz is families and working together and doing the next right thing. And I can tell you, the Bagelry restaurant that, that started, when I went to, I worked with that guy, and, and when he went to get a loan at the bank, he, they wouldn't give it to him. He sent his wife in, dressed up nicely, instead of him, he looked like an old hippie guy, and he got the loan. So mortgage lenders can be negotiated with. <laughs> Thank you for humoring me. <laughs> okay, uh, this one's for Steve. And, um, what do you think Santa Cruz's brand lacks? What could we really use in our reputation that we don't have? You know, I think Santa Cruz is a wonderful, artsy, progressive, beautifully laid back community, but it needs to have more of a technology forward looking brand. You know, I really think that we need to make ourselves a mecca for new technologies, new ideas, new entrepreneurs. Uh, I said a couple of years back that I thought Santa Cruz Next and Next Space were really the incubators for our young entrepreneurs, and now I can add Cruzio to that as well. Uh, we need to create a more of a technology economy in Santa Cruz to supplement our old style uh, sales tax and tourist and utility tax economy. But in order to do that, we need creative ideas. We need creative people. We need people who are willing to assume the larger dream. And I think in this room, you have people who are willing to take that up to assume that larger dream, to make it a reality, and make us the kind of a technology town, a technology economy that really is going to benefit us and it's going to make us a little bit more forward-leaning than we would have been without that. So that's what I'm for. This the big thinkers are here. Help us make that economy a reality. Okay, so um, I have a question for Micah, and Micah, I would like to know what type of growth and development do you see as positive for Santa Cruz, and how would you work to promote that? Well, I'd like to see a web designer in every garage and a <laughs> farm stand on every block. Um, we are we have twice the entrepreneur average of the country and we have an amazing sort of you know farm garden um, culture and um, I'm proud of it and the city is only in the way of it. You're not actually allowed to sell vegetables from your um, local garden or farm and if you want to start a small business in your garage um, you have to crawl under barbed wire especially if there's anyone that might visit you in a car. Um, so uh, that's that's my vision for an economy just like you know have the government step back a little bit you know bend some rules revise some structures and let our creative juices in this city flourish thank you this is for Pamela uh, so tell me about some of your specific ideas for facilitating check transfer uh, between the university between business and uh, between uh, our civic institutions. Tech, technology transfer, sorry, sorry. Technology transfer. Well, I think it's all about partnerships, so we just have to continue to build on the relationships that the previous city council has established and constantly get the community involved. I mean, when you hold a meeting, you could talk to some people in this room and say, where do you work, what do you do, here's what the city wants to do, let's create a partnership and uh, figure out how to accomplish more. It's all about partnerships. Uh, and uh, say specific to uh, the talent that we're creating at the university. Yeah, the talent at the university specifically is around science, is what I'm understanding. We're rated third internationally. We're just behind MIT and Princeton in, um, in international research and development, which is just huge. So we need to find out what that development is about and maybe establish some um, places like research facilities that can provide employment, um, you know. Great, thank you. 
I think that's that's the end of our Do we have examination. Questions from, you said we had to go back and answer questions if we liked one. Well, we Do we have time? I mean, are they going to kick yeah. us out? Well, I have one. Okay. Well, we so here, we were, ju we're just about out of time. We'll give each of you 40 seconds. Go down the line. So run the timer. We'll start at that end. You can answer any question you want. Say whatever you want. Micah. Hashtag SC Visitor. It would be um, advertised to our visitors on all the you know social media platforms and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Y
lot of great ideas that have been thrown around here about we should do that, and we should do that, and we should do that, and we should do that. And the reality is the city council has very finite resources. The, the city of Santa Cruz has finite resources and a lot of expectations and a lot of obligations to its community. So the city per se on its own is not really going to do any of these things. And when we are able to do them, whether it's in terms of economic development or affordable housing or social services or supporting the arts or working with tech to make it a more inviting environment, those all require partnerships. They require partnerships with other public entities. They require partnerships with nonprofits and with the private sector. And no single one of us is going to know all the answers. So I say, what I would bring is what I've brought in the past, is a willingness to listen, a willingness to partnership. I'd love to have your vote. Check out my website, www.cynthiamatthews.com. One T in Matthews. I took up some of my 40 seconds there. No. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you guys for putting the event on and thanks all of you guys for coming and, and letting us voice our, our opinions and, and um, kind of make you more familiar about where we stand on key issues and just, and just thanks for coming out and being concerned in the community. And is there any ice cream left or did I miss the boat? All right. Well guys, that's about it. Um, I want to thank all the candidates for coming. It was amazing. Please give a round of applause. Definitely Try to put on something different and exciting and maybe put you on the hot seat a little bit and hopefully we did all three of those things as well as give you a good form to speak. So thank you to Santa Cruz Next, Cruz IO, Santa Cruz Geeks, Civonomics for coming together and putting this on and thank you mostly to the citizens of Santa Cruz for showing up. Have a good night.